Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I think it is the first time that I'm giving a lecture with a view of the mountains, because where I'm from, which is Belgium, it's a quite flat, uh, flat country, so this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic view. Um, I'm working for a British university, the University of Kent, but for their Brussels campus, which is a postgraduate school on international relations, the Brussels School of International Studies. I'm just mentioning I'm actually Belgian before I will get any questions on Brexit, because as a, a matter of coincidence, in Brussels today they are discussing the possible extension, other extension, yet again for, uh, for Brexit. And I had a, a British colleague who told me last week that today the United Kingdom is so divided that from now on the UK will be called the former UK. And I leave it up to you to guess what acronym is behind, uh, behind that. But I'm going to talk about uh, Russia and the European Union. I'm going to talk about a crisis which is now five years old. It is uh, just a little bit more than five years ago that uh, Russia annexed the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea. And what I'll try to do is to bring you a bit of a, a balanced, a nuanced story. Yeah? It will not be a story that you should read as supporting any side, but it's a story in which I'll try to unravel the complexity of power. Uh, the complexity of power in the sense that if you look at Russia and the West Russia and the European Union, this is not just about economic power, not just about military power, but it's a much more complex issue. And I think it's essential to understand well the complexity of power uh, for the simple reason that if we want to understand the policies, the foreign policies on both sides, in Brussels and in Moscow, then we absolutely need to understand how they perceive power and how they have adapted strategies in function of what they perceive to be their power position, something I will explain uh, a bit later. Um, I will, however, put power in context. I will not just start right away with a theoretical analysis of power, but I'll first tell you a couple of things about, well, how did we get into that situation? Um, and my story will be one not just of power, but also of love and marriage. I will use the metaphor of a marriage that started pretty well in the early 90s, that actually continued to be reasonably well until the early 2000s, and that then got into decay, where we saw the relation uh, getting worse, the, 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 the level of trust going down, and so on. Yeah. Um, and then I'll finish by saying a couple of things about the implications this will have for the strategy. So how does it help to understand the strategies of, in particular, Russia? Because this is where the major shift in strategy has uh, come from. And I thought it might be nice to start with, with a quote, a quote by Vladislav Surkov, who is not just anyone. He is the top advisor of uh, Putin today. He's one of the most influential people in the Kremlin. He was deputy prime minister at some point. He's special advisor today on Ukraine, so he's a very influential person, and he wrote a rather strange article a couple of months ago in a uh, diplomatic Russian journal, where he uh, said something rather interesting. He said, the, we are facing today the completion of Russia's epic journey to the West, the end of uh, repeated and fruitless attempts to become part of the Western civilization, to become related to the good family, the West then being the good family. So he refers to the fact that Russia tried hard, not always successfully, but tried in the 1990s to become a normal Western country. These were the words of the very first foreign minister of post-communist uh, Russia. And he says basically, well, since the Ukraine crisis, things have changed, and inevitably, Russia will end up in what he calls 100 years of geopolitical solitude. You may be familiar with the novel by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 years of solitude. He's making, of course, a reference to that novel. He says 100 years, maybe 200, maybe 300 years of geopolitical solitude. So we have here a top advisor of Putin who says Russia has drifted away from the West. Russia was forced to give up its attempt to be part of the West after the Soviet Union collapsed. And we will have to accept that we will be a fairly isolated country. That will be important for my story, because I will try to explain that the way Russia tries to show off its power, the way Russia is bluffing about its power, showing off nuclear weapons, uh, having some planes flying in the airspace of a NATO member state, interfering in elections, whatever, that Russia does that exactly to look more powerful than they actually are. Yeah? That it is actually a strategy of what I will call Russia trying to punch above its weight, trying to appear more powerful than they are on uh, paper. So as I said, it's going to be a story about marriage and love as well. And I thought, let's start with this uh, picture. You may remember that. 
uh, it was Putin paying a visit to the Austrian Minister of Foreign Affairs when she got married last year. He dropped by on the party. And that's quite interesting. We have a deep crisis between the European Union and Russia. There are sanctions in place. Yeah? They have been there for five years. There's an absolute, uh, an absolute shortage of trust. And at the same time, we have the president paying a visit, going to the wedding of the Austrian foreign minister. And it's not just that. We've seen almost any president and any prime minister of EU member states going to Moscow to meet with Putin or to meet with high-level officials in Moscow. And the other way around, we've seen Putin in Versailles and so on. So there is still a lot going on at the bilateral level. So what we see today in relations between Russia and the European Union is a sort of ambiguity. Yeah? The relations are in a deep crisis at an all-time low. There is a lack of trust. We have five years of sanctions, but at the same time, if you look at the bilateral level, things seem to flourish. There is still a lot going on. So there seem to be two layers to the relations, what happens at the EU level and what happens in between member states of the European Union and Russia. At the same time, when you look at trade or you look at energy, business is largely continuing as usual. In 2016, there was a new record in terms of the amount of natural gas that the EU is importing from Russia. In 2016, it was just under 40% of the imported gas into the European Union that was Russian gas, which was about 10% higher than it was a couple of years before that. So the trade in energy has actually increased despite the sanctions. So how can we make sense of all that? What, what is the meaning of that? How does power fit in? Yeah, what does it tell about power? What does it tell about the level of pragmatism that still exists in relations between Russia and the European Union? And how can we explain ultimately Russia's uh, strategy in all this? Whenever you read an analysis about Russia and the EU or Russia and the West in general, very often you'll end up with a rather simplistic explanation. Yeah? And very often one side will be blamed. The West will be blamed or Russia will be blamed. So we got also among researchers a bit of a two camps, two camps that fight each other, that disagree, and that tend to pass on the blame to one of the two actors. It's either the West's fault, they should not have enlarged NATO, they should have not have built the anti-missile shield, or it's Russia's fault. Russia became assertive, became aggressive, uh, it gave up democracy, the system became quite authoritarian. That's Russia's fault. So you always get these one-sided stories. Which also means that as a researcher, you're very often uh, accused to be either a Russophobe, yeah, somebody who is scared of Russia or hates Russia, or you're seen as what, what the Germans call a Putin Versteher, somebody who understands Putin and has a certain degree of sympathy. I want to make clear from the beginning, I don't want to be, to be any of those. Yeah? I want to bring you a nuanced story that will put a lot of emphasis on perception, on why is it that Russians and Europeans very often see things in a fundamentally different way. Because it's not just all propaganda. The propaganda is there. The manipulation of media is there, no doubt. But there are also genuinely differences between the way the current international situation, the relations between the two is understood on both sides. There are different narratives, different perceptions. And I'll take that into account as well when I try to see the complexity of uh, the whole uh, story. The argument I'll try to make is that to understand uh, the current crisis, we need to understand not just the big structural reasons behind the crisis, but we also need to understand the dynamics, the process. Yeah? And it's here I'll bring in the metaphor of a marriage. Yeah? And you find it in the blue box over there. You find a sort of chronological overview of the main stages in relations between the European Union and Russia. The 1990s was a time when Russia and the EU actually wanted to work very closely together. It was a marriage of love, or at least there was an attempt on both sides to love each other. And Russia was very much willing to do what the EU wanted. Yeah, we had an EU that was actively promoting its rules, its norms, democracy, but also its free market rules to Russia. And Russia was willing to make many sacrifices and try to, ad to adapt its policy in order to fit with uh, what the EU wanted. One step further, a second stage, and then we talk roughly the decade between 2003 and 2013-14 when the Ukraine crisis starts, but there is a bit of a transition time, is a time when the marriage gets into decay. Yeah? So they're still married, but love has gone, and they start to distrust each other, and you see the marriage crumbling down. You see the trust going down. 
But that's important because this means that the Ukraine crisis in 2014 didn't happen overnight. It was not something sudden. It was actually the result of a decade where tensions had been growing. I'll refer to that as a logic of competition that had developed over a full decade, yeah? in which whatever one party did was seen as a threat to the other party. So you got distrust, you got a crumbling of good uh, relations. And then stage three is the point where um, we actually, well, end up with a divorce. We end up with a situation where uh, the two clash over Ukraine, an expected clash, though it happened in a very unexpected way. It happened in a very different way than anyone had provided. The Euromaidan protests, the annexation of Crimea, no analyst had provided a scenario like that. But it was the clash to be expected in one form or another at some point. And this is, if you wish, the end of the, uh, the marriage. It's actually funny because when I was making a similar comparison, when I was using the metaphor in another talk, I had a, a Canadian colleague who told me, you call it a marriage, but he said the marriage was never consummated. And I was thinking about it, and I said, uh, afterwards I told him, actually I think the marriage is still being consummated today, even if they are no longer married, because we still see so much trade in energy, so much uh, trade in general, there are still all these bilateral relations. So the marriage is in many ways still being consummated today, despite the fact that officially they are uh, divorced. So here's the contents of what I will do. I'll first try to explain uh, the failure of the marriage. I'll quickly go to the structural reasons. Why was the marriage not supposed to work from the beginning? But then I'll mainly focus on the dynamics, the process. Then I'll try to look into the concept of power and try to explain the complexity of power and what exactly has changed in this uh, respect. And then I'll try to explain to you how we can understand understand the shift in Russian strategy over the last couple of years against that background, against this shift in the change of power relations, or at least in the perception of Russia uh, of this change of power relations. And if we have time, I may also touch upon the global context, but it's more likely that we'll keep that for uh, the discussion. So why is it that the marriage went wrong? Why didn't it work? If you look at the structural reasons, and we go back to the early 90s, then you can say, well, actually, this was not supposed to work because the two, the two partners had different interests and different expectations. They had different projects for Europe, for a post-communist, post-Cold War Europe. On one hand, there is the idea of what uh, a colleague of mine, Richard Sacco, has called the wider Europe ID. The wider Europe ID was the idea that we just keep the organizations of the West NATO as a military organization, the European Union as a, an economic and a political organization. We just keep them in place and we extend them eastwards and we make the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe part of the EU and of NATO, which is, of course, a scenario that has effectively happened. Yeah? The former so-called satellite countries of the Soviet Union, the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe became part of the European Union and of NATO. On the other side, there was the idea of a post-communist, post-Cold War Europe that was called a greater Europe, which was an idea of a multipolar Europe with different centers of power. Now you could say in the first view, the center of power, at least symbolically, is Brussels, because Brussels has the EU institutions and it has the NATO headquarters. Now the real power, certainly for NATO, may be found in Washington, but symbolically, Brussels is the capital for both. So the greater Europe view was a view of post-Cold War Europe that would be based on different centers of power. One would be Brussels for the EU, one would be Moscow, the other one would be Ankara, yeah? Turkey as a third center of power. That was the idea that the Russians promoted, actually not just that the Russians promoted, it's an idea that goes back to Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, who actually came up in the late 1980s with his idea of what he called a common European house. And if you say house, you have to think of a Russian, a Soviet house. You have to think of a big building, one of these blocks. Yeah? And he said, Europe is a block in which we all live together. It's our common house. But we live in different apartments. We have our different interests. Yeah? We live apart, but we have to work together. We have to coordinate things because we are part of the same house. We are part of the same European civilization. We have common interests. We have a common culture. That was his idea. And the idea on which Russian, the Russian government built in the 1990s was exactly the very same idea. The common European house or the common European home 
a greater Europe, a house with different departments, with different centers of power, but close cooperation. Yeah? So it is clear that the Russian view didn't make it. Yeah? Russia saw an enlargement, an extension of NATO and the EU up to its own borders. It never had an issue with the European Union, at least not at the beginning. It even saw the European Union as an opportunity for trade and investments. But it always had a problem from the very beginning with uh, NATO. Yeah? And to illustrate that, we have a quote there by uh, Boris Yeltsin, the first post-communist leader of Russia, who said exactly that. He said, when NATO approaches the borders of the Russian Federation, you can say that there will be two military blocs, and this will be a restoration of what we already had, says Yeltsin in the mid-1990s. So he basically says, if NATO continues to exist and enlarges up to the Russian borders, we'll have a new confrontation. So if you look back at those words, they were prophetic. And the map sort of explains why. Yeah? And again, this is about perception. Yeah? This is not about saying the Russians are right or wrong. This is about the Russian perception. The map is a bit like a, a commercial for a, for a washing product before and after. So before is the map on top, the situation during the Cold War, where in blue you have the NATO member states and in red you have the countries of the so-called Warsaw Pact that were allied with the Soviet Union. This was the military bloc of the Soviet Union. The map below is the map today, I'm not sure whether it's entirely clear, but you have it probably in your head anyway, where NATO has enlarged, there is a big, bigger, much bigger part of Europe that is now blue, that is NATO territory, and Russia is largely on its own. Russia is not the leader of any real military alliance uh, these days. Yeah? If you look at it this way, you cannot say that Russia won from a strategic perspective. So if we make abstraction of all the rest, if we make abstraction of whatever you may think about the Putin regime, purely geostrategically sp speaking, this is not to the advantage of Russia. And what we see happening is that already in the late 1990s, in particular after the intervention in Kosovo, yeah, which happens by the United States and the United Kingdom, but without the permission, without the mandate of the United Nations, uh, from the late 1990s on we see that there is a consensus growing among Russian leaders that actually the West is not respecting Russia's interests and that the West is not very serious about including Russia into the Western community of states, accepting it as a normal great uh, power, if you wish. And this is something that is shared also by many Russian democratic politicians. There is one guy, for example, he's called Yevlinsky. He's still in politics today. Uh, he, was, he plays a marginal role these days, but he was traditionally seen as one of the most pro-Western liberal politicians. Well, he made a comparison in the late 90s where he said the enlargement of NATO is like a tank that is driving towards your garden. And he said NATO may say the tank is not aimed against Russia, and for that reason they paint the tank in pink and they decorate it with flowers, and they play cheerful music on the tank to convince Russia that it's not aimed against them. But said Yevlinsky, this politician, it's still a tank that is coming towards your garden. Yeah? And that summarizes what is in these maps. It is still, geostrategically, if you purely look at it from this perspective, a loss for Russia. It is Russia, it is Russia that feels pushed back. Yeah? Again, I'm talking about perception. I'm not suggesting here there is an intention, therefore, to weaken Russia or something, but the perception is definitely uh, there. Also, if you look at security uh, arrangements. We, we have a similar story. Yeah? The West was interested in setting up a collective defense system, a military alliance that is based on the principle that if one member state gets attacked, it's the duty of that member state to help the country that is attacked. Yeah? So if one of the NATO member states is attacked, if Poland is attacked tomorrow, if Lithuania is attacked tomorrow, then it's the duty of all the NATO member states to go and help that country. Yeah? While the Russian view was rather to uh, have a collective security system in which you would make arrangements, not just in Western Europe, but in bigger Europe, in greater Europe, in Europe that goes all the way to the east of Russia, to Vladivostok, yeah? you would make collective security arrangements. You would make agreements that would allow you to contain crisis to keep peace on the continent. And if we have seen one thing with the Ukraine crisis is that we have no effective collective security system today. There is no good system of containing a crisis. Yeah? We have the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. You may be familiar with it. But we have seen that at a time when the crisis over Ukraine erupts in 2014, and it's actually, it cannot react. It's left there without any capacity 
and support of its member states to play an important role. So the issue of collective security mechanisms is still on the, uh, on the agenda. As I said, Russia had from the beginning big concerns with NATO. It did not necessarily have these concerns with the European Union, you know, because it saw the European Union as an opportunity for trade, as an opportunity for political cooperation. And in 2003, the EU and Russia engaged into a so-called strategic partnership. You could say this is the official wedding. This is the point where they actually tell each other, you are so important to me that I want to work closely with you. Strategic partnership. Yeah? However, it was largely something symbolic. It was not a legal agreement. It was a sort of symbolic declaration of the importance of the other. We now consider each other as strategic partners and we consider each other as equals. So what was behind it was the idea that there was a mutual recognition of each other's interests, that the EU would respect Russia's vital interests and that Russia would respect the vital interests of the EU countries. That was the idea behind it. And it's this strategic partnership that will last for about one decade until 2013-14 when the Ukraine crisis erupts and when the strategic partnership will officially be suspended. And that's then the divorce that comes in. So these are the structural reasons. Yeah, these are the reasons why you could say the two partners married each other, but there were problems from the beginning in the sense that they had different expectations for the rest of their lives. Yeah, they have different expectations about how they would live together. Yet the question still remains, why did the crisis only occur in 2014? Why did it take so long? Why did the divorce happen when it happened? And why did the divorce, for example, not happen in 1999, when NATO enlarged for the first time, when the Kosovo intervention happened and when many things happened that shocked the Russian political elites. So why did it take so long? And that's the reason why we need to look at the second thing, which is the dynamics of the marriage, the dynamics behind the decay of a marriage, how things go wrong with small steps, the small steps of interaction that eventually will lead to the total collapse of the marriage. Yeah? And of course, this is a very complex story because what we see here is a sort of uh, a set of complex complex events that lead to an escalation where things get out of control. And I've mentioned already many of them, the NATO enlargement, the Kosovo War, there was also the American withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which was the treaty that actually banned both the Soviet Union and the Americans from building their anti-missile shields, yeah, their missile defense systems. Um, there was the interventionism of the United States throughout the 90s and after that. There was the war that Russia fought with uh, Georgia. There were the gas conflicts between Russia and the European Union, where Russia shut down gas supplies, and some EU member states like Bulgaria found themselves twice in 2006 and 2009 on a morning on the 1st of January without any gas coming into their country, because Russia had simply shut down the gas supplies, which caused a big psychological shock effect in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, there was the Libya intervention, where actually Russia event, uh, initially supported it, but then thought that the uh, Western powers had overstepped their mandate, that they had actually gone further than what they were allowed to do. They uh, toppled the regime, the Gaddafi regime, uh, instead of just protecting uh, people in uh, Libya. On top of that, you have the domestic change in Russia. You have a stable government in Russia, which was not the case anywhere in the 90s. The 90s were extremely unstable, were chaotic, where the Russian economy was plummeting, was collapsing. Um, and it's only with Putin, actually, that we get stability back in Russia, where Putin gets in, contr in control, but is also extremely lucky because Putin becomes the president almost exactly at the time where the energy prices start rising sharply. And if you know how important energy is for the Russian budget, this means that Putin had many more means at his disposal as a result of rising energy prices. So he has also been lucky because he was, as a president, for example, able to pay higher pensions to the Russian uh, pensioners. Yeah? So also there, coincidence plays uh, a role in, uh, in history. The main issue that will become the bone of contention in the marriage is what you could call the clash of integration projects. So we have on one hand the European Union that has enlarged towards the east, and that then comes up with a new project, which first is called the European Neighborhood Policy, which is broader than just Eastern Europe, but then in 2009 they launch a specific policy for Eastern Europe, which is called the Eastern Partnership. 
This is a policy of creating what the EU called privileged close relations with the neighbors of Eastern Europe, with former Soviet states like Ukraine, like Georgia, like Moldova, and so on. This is the policy that will lead eventually to the signing of an association agreement, and it is the signing or the discussion about the association agreement that will provoke the Euromaidan protests in Ukraine. So not an unimportant thing. I'll get, get back to that. On the other hand, we have Russia that launches in 2010 the Eurasian Customs Union, later on it's renamed Eurasian Economic Union, initially with Kazakhstan and Belarus, two other post-Soviet states. Later on also Armenia and Kyrgyzstan join. It's a much smaller organization, but it's a customs union. The ambition is to even create a single market among these countries. So what happens is that you have two extending integration projects that clash over the countries that sleep in between the two giants. And the most important of that country is Ukraine, a country that is facing a choice between going west in the framework of the Eastern Partnership, signing an association agreement for close cooperation with the European Union, or going with Russia and joining the Eurasian Economic Union with Russia. And the silly thing, we don't have time to go into that, but the silly thing is that actually this choice was not necessarily planned. It was the result of the way the two policies developed and the fact that the two are incompatible. In the discussion, if you wish, we can get back to the question why it was incompatible, but the reality was that you cannot be a member of the Eurasian Economic Union and sign an association agreement on free trade with the European Union. The two cannot be combined. Yeah? Therefore, countries like Ukraine have to make a geopolitical choice, which actually they never wanted to make. If you look, for example, at Ukraine's uh, trade figures before the Euromaidan protests, before 2014, before the crisis, you will see that roughly one-third of Ukraine's trade is with the European Union, roughly one-third of its trade is with Russia, and one-third of trade is with other countries. So this means that in terms of connections and interdependence, Ukraine is connected both to the European Union and to Russia. So having to make a choice to work exclusively with the EU or exclusively with Russia is not a very attractive choice. But it was not necessarily meant like that. It was the result of the policies that were followed on both sides that clashed, that collided in the middle of Europe over countries like Ukraine. Yeah? So this is where we see the marriage of convenience, which it had become in this second stage where the two parties, or the two partners are still together, but the love has gone. This marriage of convenience gets under pressure. There is increasing distrust. We see what a colleague has called the culmination of a long-term crisis, an escalatory spiral, and so on. And this happens largely because of a sort of action-reaction mechanism. We get a situation where the two parties start perceiving each other as the enemy and start understanding everything the other side does within this context. This is an enemy with bad intentions vis-a-vis -vis us. Social psychologists have a nice term for that. It's called attributional bias. Yeah? It's the idea of in-group and out-group, like, say, my group of friends and the other group of friends, that start seeing each other in a biased way, in a distorted way, because they start thinking in very stereotypical ways about the other, and they end up attributing negative intentions to the behavior of the other. Let me put that in other words. So you get a situation where whatever Russia is doing is seen by the EU and by the West as something that is aimed at restoring Russia's power and weakening the West. And the other way around, Russia starts seeing anything the West does as trying to weaken Russia. See, sees it as an inimical act against Russia. Let me just quickly jump to this slide to make that point. Just two quotes that illustrate how this attributional bias works. You have one quote by Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. At the time when the Eastern Partnership is launched, his immediate reaction is this is clearly an attempt by the EU to build a sphere of influence. So it's a geopolitical project, zero-sum reading. Yeah? It's the EU that tries to build a sphere of influence in the former Soviet Union at our expense. The other way around, it's an example from Hillary Clinton, but you find many examples of similar quotes by, by European politicians, who says when this Eurasian Economic Union is established on the Russian side, 
that this uh, is just a label that cannot uh, conceal Russia's regional power ambitions. And some politicians have expressed that in much stronger words. Some have said, this is just the beginning of the restoration of the Soviet Union. Or this is Russia trying to rebuild the old empire. So immediately you see that you get negative intentions that are attributed to the other. The behavior of the other is understood purely in terms of the negative intentions that you ascribe to the, or that you project on the other uh, party. Hmm? Good, let me skip the note on the Weimar syndrome. We may get back to, uh, to that. So this is the context. So it's a context of a post-communist Russia that seeks to cooperate closely with the European Union and the West, trying that very hard in the 1990s, up to the point that actually the way in which both sides look at each other is quite positive. In around the year 2000, there was, for example, the German Chancellor Schröder, who called Putin, who had just become president and he had been president for a year, he called him a pure Democrat. Or there was the American president, George W. Bush, who called Putin a real friend. A bit later, though, when the Americans go to war in Iraq, Putin sides with France, Germany, Luxembourg, Belgium, forming a coalition against the war in Iraq. So you have this press conference where Putin is next to the leaders of France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, all these great powers, uh, together taking a stance against the American invasion in Iraq. So there was close cooperation. In 2003, you have that strategic partnership. But then things start going down. And why is that happening? Yeah? And what has fundamentally changed? And that is the reason why I want to get to this concept of power and try to understand the complexity of power in relations between the EU and Russia. Because the image we get, the story we get, is very often one of, well, one party tries to crush the other. One party tries to win at the expense of the other. One party tries to be more powerful than the other. But the whole story is a bit more complex. And of course, the, the problem with, with power is that it is a very difficult concept to understand or to analyze. There is a, there is a nice quote by Joseph Nye, one of the famous uh, IR scholars, who says something along the lines of uh, power is like love, it's easy to experience, but it's very hard to define it. Yeah? So it's very hard to define power and to sort of indicate where exactly and how exactly power operates. And the problem is that very often in the analysis of relations between the European Union and Russia, analysts have often focused on one dimension only, the capacity to control the other. And as I'll try to make clear, this is one aspect of power. But this is not a whole story. And we miss something essential if we just focus on this capacity of control. So you could say this is a reductionist approach to power. It's reducing power to one aspect of power. I'll make myself clear in a minute. Secondly, what has often happened is that many analysts have attributed one specific characteristic of power to each actor whereby the EU was often presented as a soft power, a normative power, presenting or promoting positive norms such as democracy or the rule of law or a good governance or human rights, yeah? where very often Russia got associated with hard power, with realpolitik, with the idea of just defending its interests and trying to maximize its power. So I'll try to make the point that the real story is much more complex for the simple reason that power consists of many different multiple dimensions of different types of power. And that, moreover, power is not just about bad intentions. Power is not just about the intention to do something against the other. Power is often the result of certain decisions, certain behavior, but it's not necessarily always intended against the other. So power can be unintentional. And the best example you can give, I think, is the EU's policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine in these years before the Ukraine crisis. Yeah? The EU is trying to promote an association agreement that will have a big political impact on relations between the Ukraine and Russia. Yeah? If the EU engages into free trade agreements with Ukraine, inevitably this will have an impact on the trade relations between Ukraine and Russia. This is the same discussion as we're having about the Brexit now. Yeah? If Britain is no longer part of a customs union with the European Union, trade relations will be affected. Yeah, because all of a sudden import and export tariffs will hold. But it's the same story there. If the EU signs an association agreement on free trade with Ukraine, that will have an impact. The other way around, if Ukraine becomes a part of the customs union with Russia, the impact will even be bigger. Yeah? 
So you get a problem there of policies that are not necessarily intentionally directed against the other, against Russia or against the EU, but that nevertheless will have a real impact. So what I'm saying is that the EU maybe had no geopolitical plan for Ukraine, but the implications of what it did were somehow geopolitical. Yeah? And at the university we have every now and then people coming over from the European Union, from the External Action Service, and very often they will always be very defensive and say, we never had a sort of geo geopolitical master plan for Ukraine. We don't think in a geopolitical way. And they may be right, but that doesn't mean that your decisions have no power implications, of course. Power implications are always the result of any decision you, uh, you take. To make my point, I'll try to develop, and I'll, I'll promise to do it briefly, I'll try to develop uh, the framework of Barnett and Duval, of what they called the taxonomy of power, which was actually an attempt by two leading scholars in international relations to integrate the different theoretical views on power. Yeah? I don't know to what extent you're familiar with theories of international relations, but you have different theories focusing on different aspects of power. Structural realists, for example, will focus on military capabilities as the main aspect of power. Yeah? So what they try to do in their taxonomy, in their model of power, is to bring these different types of power, the different theories of power together in one uh, taxonomy, in one model. And you have the model summarized here. And it's a little bit complex theoretically, so let, let me try to keep it as simple as possible. You should read the scheme in two ways. Yeah? First of all, the first thing you have to note for all the four types of power, so compulsory, institutional, structural, productive, all four types of power refer to a relationship. Power is always about relations. Yeah? I cannot be powerful on my own. I can only be powerful vis-a-vis -vis somebody else. So you always speak about relations between actors. Now, there are two ways to look at these relations. Power works through the interaction of specific actors. So it's the interaction between two actors in which you see power happening. Or it's power that works through so-called relations of constitution, constitutive relations. Yeah? For those who are familiar with theories, Think of constructivism, for example, yeah? and how identities are constituted in social interaction. We create identities by interacting. Yeah? Well, here's the same idea. You can create identities in the way actors interact. Yeah? That's one way of looking at it. Second way of looking at it, and there we get the columns, the vertical part of the scheme, is what they call the rel relational specificity. In other words, do we speak about relations that are direct from actor A to actor B? Or do we speak about relations which are indirect, which are diffuse? And here they come up with four different models that fit into this taxonomy, that fit into these two dimensions. Yeah? And let me again try to explain them in, in the simplest way possible. First one is compulsory power. This is probably the sort of power we think of mostly when we use the word power. It's the capacity of direct control. I can make you do something. Yeah? This is an element of power. And this can be military control. This can be economic control, because my economy is stronger than yours. You're dependent on me, so I can make you do certain things. It can make, take many different forms. Yeah? But it can also be symbolic. It can also be my capacity to shame you, because you have not done something that I wanted you to do. These are all forms of compulsory power. It's direct from one actor to another, and it's a form of interaction. Institutional power, on the other hand, is power that is indirect. So I'm not exerting power over you, but I do something that changes the conditions in which you all operate. If you have to study for an exam, and I keep you awake the nights before because I make a party in your house, and you cannot study, and you cannot sleep, you will not do a good exam. I have not exerted power directly, but I have indirectly exerted power by changing the conditions in which you had to operate. Well, international relations, this can be done, for example, to a treaty. Let's say a free trade treaty. So if you sign a free trade tre treaty with country C, but not with country B, you don't do anything directly against country B, but it may still impact on the conditions in which country B is operating. Or think of a treaty where you set certain environmental standards. If you say that cars can only produce a certain number of CO2 emissions, 
and you manage to make that the global norm that all countries in the world have to accept, that will have power implications. Yeah? Because countries will have to adapt, and the countries that have no strict legislation will have to adapt much more than others. So you exert a lot of indirect power over those countries. That is institutional power. So it's not the capacity of direct control, but it's the capacity to change the conditions, the circumstances in which other actors operate. So in the case of the EU and Russia, it's the capacity, for example, of the EU and Russia, to ch of the EU to change the conditions in which Russia operates or the other way around. Yeah? I'll make it more specific in a, in a minute. And then constitutive forms of power. I'll just limit myself to structural power. This is about the capacity to determine identities, the capacity to say who you are. Again, think in international relations in terms of, for example, the terminology that American presidents have used in the past, where American presidents spoke about the axis of evil to refer to, to, refer to countries like Iran and North Korea that was long before uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un were good friends, sort of good friends. Um, the axis of evil is a way of creating an identity for another and excluding that other from the decent community of states. Or think about the term rock states, which was another term from the American administration to exclude certain countries and to basically say you are sort of secondary states. Failed states is another one. If you manage to make these identities widely accepted, you create power through your capacity to create identities. And this is what structural power is about, the capacity to create an identity and the hierarchy that goes with that. Yeah? Because if you create an identity and you say, well, you have failed states and you have effective states, you create a hierarchy between good states and bad states. If you say the axis of evil, you create a hierarchy between the decent states and the states that do not deserve to be part of the world community. So it's not something neutral. It creates hierarchy. It creates power. And again, I'm not going into it, but the... Um, the difference between structural and productive power is that structural power refers to something that is quite stable, a stable hierarchy, where the identities roughly stay the same. So it's confirming an existing hierarchy. While productive power refers much more to how in discourse and on the basis of accidental contingent changes, we continuously adapt in small networks these hierarchies and these identities. For those interested, this is more the post-structuralist approach, this is more the approach of Foucault, for example, is more the productive one. I will not talk about that one, because if we want to talk about that one, we have to go into very, very specific cases and almost do a case study on one aspect of power. Yeah? But the idea behind these two forms is the same. Both, both are forms of constitutive power. Yeah? So both are about the creation of identities. Now, what is extremely important in this taxonomy of Barnett and Duval is that these four dimensions of power always coexist. So it's not that you always have one. No, the four always operate together. In all international relations, you will have aspects of these four power relations. Yeah? So you have compulsory power, institutional power, structural productive power. And you make a theoretical mistake if you limit yourself just to one sort of power. Well, not necessarily mistake, but at least you should be aware of the limitations of your, of your analysis if you do that. And that's important. And this is why, in the next step, I want to make clear to you that what we have seen in the relations between the EU and Russia is a shift in the sort of power struggle that took place. So again, power always operates along these four dimensions. You always have compulsory, institutional, structural power together. But before the Ukraine crisis of 2014, the emphasis, or the main competition, was over institutional and structural power. While after the Ukraine crisis, the emphasis has shifted towards compulsory power, sanctions, military buildup, showing off with new nuclear weapons, these sort of things. So it's a different power game that is being played. So let me try to make that point and, and then try to show how this has affected Russia's uh, strategy, this shift in the perception of the power game that is being played. So before the Ukraine crisis, the power struggle is predominantly about institutional and structural power. So institutional power, remember, it's the capacity to control the conditions in which another actor operates. So in this case, we're mainly looking at the institutional arrangements, the forms of cooperation that Russia and the EU were trying to set up 
in what has been called the common neighborhood in the countries in between, in those former Soviet states that are squeezed between the EU and Russia. Countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and so on. So it is here that this clash of integration projects comes up. It was a struggle that actually was one of the main factors that led to the decay of the marriage, where distrust was growing over the fact that Brussels didn't trust what Moscow was doing in the common neighborhood, and Moscow didn't trust what Brussels was doing in the common neighborhood. Yeah? The quotes I gave of Lavrov and Hillary Clinton as examples of this distrust. You could make a similar story about the enlargement of NATO, and then on the other hand, the collective security treaty organization, which is the security organization on the Russian side, but it's an organization that in no way is, the, is a match for NATO. It's a much weaker organization, also a much smaller organization, so it is not the same type of organization. So let's focus on the EU and its Eastern Partnership and Russia and the Eurasian Economic uh, Union. If you go back in time, again, back to the 1990s and way into the years 2000, you could say that the EU enjoyed what you could call a form of normative hegemony. The EU was setting the norms for the former communist countries. It was doing that very explicitly in the enlargement process through the Copenhagen criteria, yeah, the three conditions you have to fulfill in order to become a, a member of the European Union. But it was also doing that in the neighborhood policy in the Eastern Partnership, where the EU was actively imposing conditions upon its neighbors, and in return for that they were rewarded with free trade, closer cooperation with the European Union. Now, the thing is that throughout the 1990s, this position of the European Union was not contested. This is why you can say the EU was actually a normative hegemon. The norms of the European Union were not contested. This may sound strange for your generation, but me, being uh, much older, remember the early 90s and the discussions about the book of Fukuyama, for example, about the end of history, where Fukuyama was very much convinced about the fact that the future was to liberal democracy and a free market was to the Western model, and all states would slowly move in the direction of the Western model, and there would be peace and boredom once and forever. It's not exactly what has happened, but it indicates how dominant the norms were, in the very simple sense that the norms were considered to be universal, universally applicable. There was no important ideological alternative. So Russia and other former communist countries in the 1990s were just willing to copy the Western model. I'm not saying they did it well. Russia had a lot of trouble doing it, and it, it never really functioned very well. But at least the intention was there. They wrote a liberal democratic constitution in the early 90s, rewrote it in 93, but it always remained a liberal democratic constitution, which is not necessarily very different from that of any West European uh, state. Yeah. At the same time, you could also say there was an incompatibility that got into the EU's policy. I'll mention that very briefly. We can also get back to it uh, afterwards if you wish. But the EU developed actually two different policies for Eastern Europe. It had its Eastern Partnership for countries like Ukraine, in which it basically told Ukraine, you'll become a privileged partner of us, you'll become part of a free trade zone with us, you get access to our single market, and at the same time, it was part of this strategic partnership, this marriage of convenience with Russia, where they basically told Russia, we'll take your interest seriously, we will respect Russian vital interests. The two cannot be combined because Russian interest number one is to keep control or to keep a certain degree of influence in the former Soviet Union, in countries like Ukraine. And that again explains why the distrust grows. Yeah, for Russia, it was incompatible that the EU would tell it will respect your interests, and at the same time, they would set up their project for free trade with Ukraine. From a Russian perspective, that could not be matched. So, one of the main dimensions along which the power struggle took place is this institutional power struggle over the neighborhood. Can we convince countries to join either the Eastern Partnership and sign association agreements with the EU, or can Russia convince them of joining the Eurasian Economic Union? Second dimension, structural power. It's this competition, in simple terms, over who determines who has what identity. And identity number one is the, capac is the capacity to determine Europeanness, the capacity to determine which country is a European country. This may sound trivial, but it's not. If you have the capacity to determine which country is European and which country is not, that gives you power. 
And there we see a very interesting change. If you go back to the 1990s and you look at EU documents signed with Russia and with Ukraine, both Russia and Ukraine were called members of the European family, sharing European values, part of the European civilization. So the EU defined Russia and Ukraine as European countries in the 1990s. If you look at more recent documents, before the Ukraine crisis though, then you'll see that actually Ukraine is still defined as a European country in even stronger terms. The association agreement is justified on the basis of the Europeanness of Ukraine. While in the case of Russia, most documents say, well, Russia is important, we have to cooperate with them because it's such a big and important country that we cannot ignore them. But the reference to Russia being a European country has entirely disappeared. Again, it's not as trivial as it looks. It's the capacity to determine identity. And again, the EU throughout the 1990s was in a very strong position to do that because Russia was so weak, Russia wasn't sure which way it was going, and what the EU stood for was the model. It, was, it had a semblance of universality. It was seen as the only model to follow. Everybody wanted to be part of the European Union. Yeah? So it was an uncontested power of the EU back in the 1990s. I'm, of course, slightly simplifying the story to pass on the message, but it was largely uh, a capacity of the EU to determine the model to follow for the others. Russia at some point, and that becomes quite clear as of 2004, for different reasons, one of them is the Orange Revolution, changes its policy, and where it always tried to cooperate with the EU and try to do largely what the EU was telling, try to do, it basically says around 2004, we don't accept that anymore. In the beginning it's a little bit unclear, but as of 2007 or something, it becomes very clear that Russia puts itself in a totally different position, where it says, in the words of Foreign Minister Lavrov, for example, we do not want to follow in the slipstream of the European Union. Yeah? It is not the EU that has to tell us what we should do. This is the time, in 2005, I believe, when, for example, that famous concept of sovereign democracy comes up. Sovereign democracy is a term that was launched by the same guy of whom I give you the quote at the beginning, Surkov, his advisor of Putin. And basically the term meant nothing else but, okay, Russia wants to be a democracy. Russia is on its way to become a democracy. But we have the sovereign right to choose our path to democracy. It's not up to the West to tell us how to become democratic or what sort of democracy we should have. Of course, we all know that behind that is a growing concentration of power and a bringing down of the democratic standards in Russia, which shows again that also domestic factors play a role. Yeah, it was useful for Russia to say that because they disliked the EU meddling in internal affairs, but it was also very useful as a sort of legitimation for the changes that were taking place within Russia, which meant reducing the democracy in Russia, yeah? bringing in a system of managed democracy or authoritarianism or whatever term you want to use for it. So what we see is a change where, and, and a power struggle in which Russia puts itself very strongly on a counter-hegemonic point of view. It rejects the hegemonic dominant position of the European Union and it says, we go our own way. Yeah? And today Russia does that in a very funny way. It does it in a very ambivalent way. On one hand, they have turned to Eurasia. It's not by accident that this economic union is called the Eurasian Economic Union. So they basically say, well, if Europe doesn't want us, and if Europe says we are not European, we'll turn to Eurasia. So we turn away. We don't need Europe. At the same time, you have this whole discourse that comes up in Russia, where Russia claims that actually Russia stands for the real Europe. We are the genuine Europeans. We stand for the European values that Europe itself has betrayed. And these values then are in the Russian mindset, or at least of some of the elites, because it's not always such a clear government policy, but in the mindset of some elites, these are arch-conservative values. Yeah? These are conservative values where they go against uh, same-sex marriage or this sort of issues, where you have almost an obsession among part of the Russian elite about uh, what they call gay Europa. Like Europe is entirely determined by gay values. Yeah? Again, it sounds trivial, but it's not, because there's a sort of bigger power struggle there going on about identity. It's a Russia that claims that they stand for the real European values, which is a super conservative interpretation of what these European values are. And it's not by accident that people like Marine Le Pen go and visit Putin in the Kremlin and are received with a lot of visibility there. 
because that's exactly where you find the match, yeah, where these sort of radical right parties often stand for similar values than Russia claims to be the real European values. So Russia there tries to come in as the defender of the real values to some radical parties. Yeah? That is how you have to understand this idea. But again, of course, this doesn't mean that nothing was happening on the other fronts of power. We had the energy crisis, the energy spats, where Russia shut down gas supplies. We had issues about the anti-missile defense. We had issues about access to markets. There was a lot of other things going on. But these were two crucial dimensions of the power struggle before the Ukraine crisis. After the Ukraine crisis, this shifts dramatically. Again, I'll put it in more simple terms than it is, again, to convey the message. But basically what it comes down to is that Russia comes to the conclusion after the Ukraine crisis that they have lost the battle on these two institutional and structural fronts. Ukraine signs the association agreement with the EU. Moldova signs the association agreement with the EU. Georgia signs the association agreement with the EU. This means that none of these countries can become members of the Euro Eurasian Economic Union. So the feeling is Russia lost the institutional power battle. Same with identity. Russia feels itself increasingly isolated. Russia is no longer called a European country. It's excluded from Europe. So it feels we lost the battle. We go our own way and we go We'll try maybe a coalition of the willing with those countries that want to share our values, and there are a couple that want to do that. So you get a situation where Russia thinks that basically they lost the battle. They found themselves on the losing end in the competition along institutional and structural dimensions. And this is where we get a totally different reading, a totally different narrative about the Euromaidan crisis and uh, what happens afterwards. Yeah? The story in the West is one of a democratic uprising against the authoritarian regime of President Yanukovych that eventually leads to a change of power. The Russian version is one of a coup d'etat, which is often referred to as a fascist coup d'etat, which of course rings a lot of bells for the Russians because of the Second uh, World War. Uh, and it's the fascists, the extreme nationalists in Ukraine taking over with the support of the West masterminded by the West. That is the view they develop in Russia. Totally different narratives, totally different perceptions of what happens. Yeah? And again, I'm not promoting any perception, but there is not just a propaganda effort there, there is a fundamentally different understanding of what has happened. And of course, the idea that there was a fascist coup d'etat is, 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 is totally exaggerated, is totally invented. Uh, there are some small nationalist groups in Ukraine that are very radical and fascist, but they do not stand for the majority of the Ukrainians. Yeah? But still, the perception is there, and it's a deep perception. And then we see a Russia that reacts in a very compulsory way. Surprise act, annexation of Crimea. A war that is clearly imported, that is started with Russian support and Russian interference in eastern Ukraine. It is not something that happens because of a local uh, uprising. I was talking to somebody from Donetsk, but who now lives in Kiev just a couple of weeks ago, who said that they saw it happening. They saw these activists, these groups coming from Russia to steer up protests yeah, and to start violence. So it was very much an imported protest, an imported war, imported by Russia in eastern Ukraine. So we see there a Russia that opts for very different means, and not just against its neighbors, but against the West, and that's an important distinction uh, to make, of course. And it uses, first in Crimea, this what uh, Roy Allison has called deniable intervention. Yeah, remember when the Russians took over Crimea, they always claimed they were not there. There were these green men, these green soldiers without any identification, and for a long time Russia said they are not our soldiers. Later on Putin admitted they were there. But it was this takeover by stealth. In a very rapid surprise move, in a couple of months a referendum was organized and Crimea became officially part of the Russian Federation. So what we see happening here is a shift to a compulsory power struggle, but one that I would call negative compulsory power, in the sense that Russia's attempt is not so much one of direct control, which is the reason why it has never annexed eastern Ukraine. Yeah, the war is still going on at low intensity, it's still going on, but Russia at no point has tried to make it part of its own territory. But it's negative compulsory control in the sense that Russia wants to prevent the West from getting any useful control over Ukraine. To put it in different words, what Moscow says is, well, if we lost Ukraine, that's their geopolitical perception of affairs. We lost Ukraine to the West. And Ukraine is of 
tremendous importance to Russia strategically, historically, culturally. It's not just any country, because it's a country that shares centuries of history with Russia. But the idea is we lost Ukraine to the West. Let's now try to make sure that Ukraine becomes a liability, becomes a problem for the West, that it doesn't become a useful ally. Yeah? If we keep the war going, which also implies that the economy cannot grow and it has not grown over the last years in Ukraine at all, then we create a situation where actually the West cannot exert its power or will not benefit from its control over Ukraine. That's why I call it negative compulsory power. It's not aimed at direct control of Ukraine in the first place. It's aimed at preventing useful control by the West as a first, as a first, uh, first objective. Yeah? Um, again, in the box there, you see a, uh, a reference to the annexation of Crimea and how it meant the precedent. I'll also keep that for the discussion to which I would like to get, uh, to get soon enough so we have time for questions. So I will get back to that with pleasure to, to try to explain to you how the annexation of Crimea has created a very dangerous precedent in, let's say, post-Second World War Europe, yeah, where the annexation of territories is actually a taboo. But let's keep that for later if you're, uh, if you're interested. In terms of long-term strategy, so we now see a Russia that has positioned itself on a very assertive position, actively voicing its protest against the West, so a, strongly, a strong position of contestation, of counter-hegemony, of challenging the West, rejecting what uh, Putin called the neo-containment of the West. You're probably familiar with the term containment that the uh, American administration under Truman used to contain the expansion of the Soviet Union and later on the expansion of communism. Well, Putin basically said in his famous speech after the annexation of Crimea, he said the West never stopped doing that containment policy. They still do it. There is still a neo-containment policy going on. They still try to contain and to squeeze Russia. And he even uses a metaphor. He says, it's like a spring. You can only uh, squeeze the spring so hard until it snaps back. That's Putin saying, now Russia is snapping back. Russia is reacting after these years of humiliation and oppression. Yeah? of containment by the West. Again, Russian narrative. I'm not saying Putin is, is giving a right analysis there. Or he speaks about the West imposing its unilateral diktat, imposing it upon Russia and other uh, countries. So Russia puts itself on this very vocal, assertive position, actively challenging the West all the time with a very clear, sometimes violent, aggressive rhetorics. But it has one problem. And Russia's problem is that it doesn't have the real capabilities and the power instruments at his disposal to really be powerful enough to contest the position of the West. Just a few tables, I'll, I'll be very brief about them, but just to illustrate how we tend to overrate Russia's power. And here I will only be looking at capabilities as an illustration. But we could make similar points when it comes to identity, uh, structural power, when it comes to institutional arrangements. Uh, Russia is in many ways in a rather weak position in that case, mainly because it's a rather isolated country. Russia has no major allies. Again, the question may come up, how about China? I'm happy to deal with that during the question round, but I don't think China is in any way an ally of Russia. Yeah? But you take me too far from that. If you look at um, this table, this gives you actually an overview of the relative position of the Russian economy over time. 1992 is the first year after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then we have the most recent data available, 2017. Well, the Russian economy in 1992 was around 5% of the world economy. It was a bit bigger than the Chinese economy back then. Today, the relative share of the Russian economy in the world is a bit above 3%, while the Chinese one has gone up to 18%. Depending on how you calculate, you may find slight differences, but it's always the same trend you will see. So in relative terms, Russia has declined a lot, and compare it to the United States and the EU, despite their relative decline as well, there's a huge difference in gap. There's a huge gap better between Russia and, for example, the European Union. The size of the EU's economy is about 11 times that of uh, the Russian economy. The Russian economy is smaller than the Italian economy. Yeah? For a country that is so rich in natural resources, exports so much oil and gas, this is not necessarily a tremendous achievement. You get, of course, a very different view if you look at nuclear weapons where the number of nuclear warheads are 
at par between the United States and Russia, and that's not by accident because this is, this is the result of international treaties that date back to the end of the Cold War that have been renovated and where the two countries have agreed to keep a similar number of warheads. It's these treaties, by the way, that are now, now all one by one crumbling down and disappearing, which is something that should not make us very happy for the future because the whole arms control regime that was set up in the late years of the Cold War and in the beginning of the post-Cold War time is disappearing. That's a different story. So there, of course, Russia is still a big power. The question is, how does nuclear capacity translate into daily power? Also, Britain is a nuclear power. In the Brexit negotiations, Britain cannot threaten to drop a nuclear bomb on the EU to have a stronger negotiation position. Yeah, this is my point. Nuclear weapons are useful in the sense that they create status. They are useful in extreme circumstances of war, but they do not necessarily generate diplomatic power on very specific debates. Or as some scholars have put it, power is always context specific. Yeah? It's the capabilities that are relevant in a certain field that make a difference and that create power. Yeah? So if the discussion is on energy between the EU and Russia, then nuclear power of Russia will not make a difference if, in, in terms of, of uh, improving Russia's interests and position, for example. Military expenditure, last example I give, just to, to, to try to convey the point that there is a tendency to overrate Russia's material capabilities, material power. This is military expenditure. This is the percentage that countries spend on military affairs. So say this is a pot of $100, and this is how many dollars this country spent on military affairs. Number one, the United States, 35%. So $35 out of $100 spent on military affairs is spent by the United States. This was in the 1990s much more. This was more than 50% even. If you take the United States together, with its NATO allies, assuming that NATO will continue to exist and that Trump will not do anything, uh, anything funny there, um, then we actually see that it's around 60%. So NATO stands for almost 60% of military expenditure in the world. And look where Russia stands, 3.8%. Uh, of course, this doesn't tell you the whole story, but it gives you some indication. 60% yeah? for NATO, 3.8% for Russia. Does that mean that Russia has no power, cannot use its military capacity? Of course they can, and they can in the first place against their neighbors, which is exactly what they have done. But the sort of stories that we will have a Russia that will attack NATO, that is, a less, that is less likely to happen, yeah? if only because of this. Yeah? But again, it's only one indicator. Yeah? It tells you one part of the story. But it shows that it is not necessarily very balanced. Yeah? If you think that Russia and the United States used to be the rivaling superpowers in a bipolar system of the Cold War, there is far from any balance today. Yeah? Russia is, in military affairs, still a small player in comparison to the United States. Of course, and this is why you have always this confusion about statistics, if you look at how much Russia is spending in comparison to the size of its economy, you get a totally different story. Yeah? Because then Russia is a big spender, it spends more than 4% of its GDP of its economy on military affairs. To conclude, this weakness of Russia, or this contrast between Russia's relative weakness in terms of its capabilities and of, because of the fact that it's isolated, stands in contrast with Russia trying to contest Western hegemony. And this explains Russia's tactics, I would say it's tactics more than strategy, of trying to be omnipresent and visible in all areas of power. Interference in elections, uh, hacking, uh, I do not think all these things generate all that much real power, but it creates the visibility. And power is ultimately about perception. So we have a Russia that tries to punch above its weight, try to look more powerful than it actually is, through these tactics of uh, using what one colleague has called a full spectrum of power, many different means of power, so it looks very visible. And it has done in a tactically very smart way. Look at the war in Syria, for example, where Russia became a game changer. Uh, where Russia finds itself in a position where it did uh, not just change the outcome of the war, but is now in the pole position to determine the post-conflict settlement if the war is over at, uh, at some point. Will that benefit Russia in the long term? I'm absolutely not sure. And this is why I put a cartoon there. Putin made Russia great, again, sort of great, because in the short term, Russia has definitely gained, has definitely yielded benefits. In the long term, there's a lot that will play against Russia, not least the fact that they burned all bridges with Ukraine, 
and that this country that is always historically so important to Russia will probably not have any good relations with Russia in many years or maybe many decades uh, to come. And the election results in Ukraine uh, in uh, two weeks, I believe, will maybe give us more of a clue about how that will further evolve. I'll conclude here so we can still take uh, a couple of questions because I'm sure that many of the things I will have mentioned will give rise to uh, views as it is always the case with, with Russia. So if you have any questions, please, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. And uh, welcome. I just want to say, your, um, you can also ask a question in Italian if you feel a bit embarrassed or I don't know, uncomfortable in English. So just, in, just to give you a little extra opportunity, if you want, and then I translate, of course. Sure, there must be disagreement on something. So don't uh, <laughs> don't be shy. Just. Try your luck. The yeah, icebreaker. Okay. Um, regarding Crimea, um, like the annexion of Crimea by Russia was happened after the referendum, as you said. Um, could not we consider that as um, uh, how to say as um, self determination of Crimea? It's a kind of a provocation, but. And that, that's indeed the, the Russian argument, that it is self-determination. Uh, it's interesting to see what international legal experts tell about that. And international law agrees on the fact that a referendum is not a sufficient reason for independence. So if anyone, if Tento wants to become independent, you organize a referendum, you say we're independent, that doesn't count under international law. Yeah? That's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that the referendum was also organized in, well, not the most optimal circumstances, military presence of the Russian army, uh, and it was organized very quickly. So you could say maybe the, the, the Scottish case was a different one, where you had the referendum after years of discussions and debate, and then the Scots could, with the agreement of the government, say whether they wanted to be independent or not. This was, of course, a referendum organized in very short term in a, in a context of conflict with military presence on the ground, without international monitors, and so on. Yeah? So I think the argument of self-determination is told. That being said, the Russians have always said, yeah, but we haven't created a precedent. The precedent is Kosovo because Kosovo was made independent from Serbia, or what was co still called small Yugoslavia back then, uh, because of a military intervention by the Americans and, and the United Kingdom. And also military intervention is not a legal reason, actually excludes the possibility of independence. And to some degree they have a point, yeah? From an international legal perspective, also the independence of Kosovo was not legal. Of course there is one difference, that is that uh, Kosovo has not become part of the American territory. It has not been annexed while Crimea has become part. And in that sense, I still believe that it has created a dangerous precedent where it has broken the rules on uh, the inviolability of borders and uh, territorial integrity that have characterized Europe ever since the Second World War and certainly since the Helsinki Final, final Act. Yeah? But again, it's a story where there are different views on both sides. Other questions? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you tell, tell us something about the Russian strategy towards the Middle East, if there is any? Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, you could say Russia made a comeback in the Middle East. Russia was a country that, at the time of the Soviet Union, had important interests in the Middle East, had also some close allies in the Middle East, uh, but lost them all with the end of the Cold War, except Syria and Assad, you could say and in particular then the, the, the presence of a, a, a naval basis for the Russian army in the port of Tartus in Syria has always been of crucial importance to Russia because that gave them direct access to the Mediterranean Sea without having to go through the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus Strait, without having to go through, through NATO territory. Um, so what Russia has done is, is make, make a comeback, which they have done in a spectacular way in the case of Syria, by military intervention in a very open, demonstrative way, very different from what they did in Crimea. You know? to make a statement, we back. But they have also managed to build good relations with many different states, including some states that were traditionally not on the Russian side, even Saudi Arabia, for example. 
uh, has now close relations, close, closer relations, I should say, with, uh, with Russia. Egypt is another case where uh, under Mubarak, for example, Mubarak was in the first place the ally of the United States. Now Russia has also increasingly good relations with Egypt. So we have seen a Russia that has made a comeback in the Middle East through small steps, yeah? small steps in which they try to increase their influence, their links, very often also through commercial means, energy means, where they try to get a foot on the ground through close cooperation. Yeah? And part of it is also inspired by the fact that the Americans have not entirely withdrawn from the Middle East, but at least reduced their presence. In particular, under Obama, there was a clear policy of keeping lower profile in the Middle East. This has left a sort of vacuum, is maybe too big a word, a certain vacuum that Russia then has, has uh, filled in different uh, countries. There's also a relation with Iran that is, of course, very important. But interesting enough, Russia has a fairly pragmatic approach there. So it has good relations with Iran. But at the same time, it's one of the big defenders of keeping the uh, Iran nuclear deal. But at the same time, it has managed to build fairly good pragmatic relations with Saudi Arabia as the arch enemy of Iran. So in that sense, it tries to have a sort of multi-vector policy of keeping good relations with different, uh, different countries. And you could say it's part of this power strategy as well. It's part of creating more global Russian presence again, which Russia largely lost after the, the end of the Cold War. Any more questions? So in, in this last part, we, we talked a lot about uh, uh, the Russian strategy. But uh, I was wondering, um, is the European Union just uh, um, watching uh, at uh, Russia um, um, applying this strategy, approaching to China and isolating itself from Europe, uh, or is the European Union also trying to do something to cope with this situation and uh, overcome the Ukrainian crisis uh, or um, um, try to reestablish uh, a relationship with Russia? Yeah, good question. Um, and I, I didn't deal with it for a simple reason. I didn't have enough time to do it, but it's, it's of course, relevant. It's largely a reaction to what has happened over Ukraine and what they see the shift in Russia's approach, Russia's foreign policy, Russia's reaction to the events. Um, so you, you can clearly see that the EU has moved towards what, what itself calls principled pragmatism. I understood you had Natalie Tocci uh, speaking here. It's, of course, a very old place to talk about that because I think she's sort of uh, the inventor of the concept, uh, as close advisor of Mogherini. Um, it's the idea that the EU is uh, putting less emphasis on the promotion of norms, but is uh, sort of trying to find a combination of geopolitical realism, pragmatism, and sticking to its principles, therefore pragmatical, uh, uh, principled pragmatism, that's the term. Or a colleague of mine, Richard Youngs, has, has spoken about liberal redux geopolitics, which means the EU has become more of a conscious geopolitical actor, thinking more in terms of spheres of influence, interests, uh, challenges coming from Russia, coming from China, wherever, but at the same time has not entirely given up its sort of liberal approach, its approach of defense of democratic norms, free market principles. Let's not forget that this is always much more important in the EU foreign policy, the promotion of free market principles, the single market principles, if you wish, and actually democracy. So it's a combination of, of, uh, of the two. And, and you see that from a lot what, what is being said, also in terms of resilience, for example, the emphasis on the EU side is much more on power aspect. The EU has to be resilient to deal with the global challenges, to deal with the threat that comes from Russia. And this is a policy that, that is carried out on many different fronts. Yeah? It, it's, a, it's partly the case for military cooperation. Think about this permanent structured cooperation the EU is now developing. But it's also in terms of resilience uh, in fighting fake news and this sort of topic. So there's a whole front of things. There's also a full spectrum approach where the EU, EU tries, tries to be active. On China, on the other hand, of course, we see that uh, even if the EU is probably also more aware there, and there was an EU-China summit in Brussels just now, and the EU was sending some signals to China over the last couple of weeks, that, that, that China should play a fair game and they should not abuse their power. But at the same time, we see a sort of pragmatic, continued close cooperation with China. So they do not follow in the trail of Trump where they securitize relations with China. That has not happened. Yeah? And of course, the EU is still in the first place a single market, and it still very strongly thinks in terms of economic interests. And one of the economic interests is to keep relations, close relations with China going as the second most important trading, trading partner for, uh, for the EU. Yeah? So I would say in terms of strategy, we see a strategy uh, which is also more assertive, more geopolitical, but not going as far as the sort of policy that Russia has been following over the last couple of years.
Anything else? So I like, if I don't mind, I like to ask you one last question um, because the the last section of this class is going to be uh, on uh, is going to focus on the Balkans and the relationship between the EU and the Balkans. So in this regard, I like to ask you your understanding of the role of Russia in the Balkans because it looks like Russia has been uh, playing uh, an increasingly active role, etc. And uh, in part, uh, is coherent with, with what you explained today, but. Uh, I was wondering if you have something more to add specifically about the Balkans. Yeah. It, it, it's a very interesting case, and it's not just Russia, it's also Turkey that is increasingly active on the Balkans and is also using its, its uh, heritage in some Balkan countries there for its own advantage. Um, we see indeed a Russia that is more active, and in particular in some countries it's active, like Serbia. What is always striking, I find, and I'm not a Balkan expert at all, but it, it's a discrepancy between what a part of the public opinion thinks and the official policies that are being carried out. Uh, Serbia is a country where you will see quite some Russian flags and portraits of Putin. Some people put it in front of their window, have a poster of Putin. Uh, nevertheless, the policy of the government is still a policy of joining the European Union. This is still key priority number one. So, as you said, Russia is trying to follow a similar strategy towards the Balkan in terms of pushing back the Western influence, pushing back the presence of the European Union, pushing back the presence of NATO. There were all these rumors about the, 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 the conspiracy to kill the Montenegrin uh, Prime Minister and that Russia would have behind, been behind it. It's always hard to know what exactly has happened there. But very clearly, Russia has a strategy of pushing, pushing back, trying to be present. Whether it has been all that successful, I'm not sure. In some fields, yes. In the field of energy, for example, some important contracts have been signed and there is a certain degree of influence. But the question again is, Will that translate into real political power? And you could say that moment only happens if Russia manages to really discourage countries like Serbia from becoming members of the European Union. And for the time being, I don't see any sign of that because I think the understanding of the Serbian leaders is still that the best interest, the best economic interest in the first place for them is to join the European Union. This has the, the, the best chances to survive, I think. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you.